space, a transfixing nothingness that defies human comprehension with the power to crush the spirit from any living thing. I am, of course, talking about the empty space you find in some board game boxes. Look at that. But today we're looking at a game that is trim enough that it contains no empty space in the box and yet contains all of the grandeur of outer space. Our top board game scientists have told me that this makes the search for Planet X a paradox. And for that reason, oh, it, it's either you can't watch this video or you have to watch this video to the end, otherwise the universe will stop existing. The point is, you folks should behave for once. This is a fantastic game by Ben Rossett and Matthew O'Malley and provided to us by Publishers Renegade. And what we've got here is a contest of raw logic for one to four players who, in a first for shut up and sit down, represent competing telescopes. During setup, everyone gets their own personal piece of paper that implies whatever's about to happen, it's going to be troublingly involved. And you get your own personal screen, like the world's most ineffective COVID shields, just to round out the impression that you're an ill-prepared pupil about to sit an exam. And that impression is not really completely wrong. You see, the heart of this game is a race to deduce where Planet X is. And that question is so difficult to solve that a lot of this game is played in steely silence. You see, this circle on your piece of paper with 18 pie segments corresponds to this circular board with 18 pie segments. And when the game starts, the app, which is free and great by the way, will decide which of these 18 segments secretly contains Planet X, and it will populate the rest of the segments with other hangers-on of our solar neighborhood, like dwarf planets and gas clouds and asteroids. And on the inside of your screen, you can also see some of the logic rules that will always apply in games of Planet X, such as asteroids are always next to other asteroids, or gas clouds are always adjacent to at least one truly empty sector. The game uses the word truly there because in all of your simulated stargazing, Planet X appears as an empty sector. So it's only by populating this entire circle with objects and figuring out where everything is that you will finally be able to work out where Planet X has to be through process of elimination. And then you can ask for its loan repayments or ask if it wants to go out for a drink or whatever it is that astronomers do when they locate new planets. As a final bit of setup, the app will feed each player secretly a few additional crumbs of information, letting you know where a few of these things won't be found. And with that, the game is afoot. Or should I say, a space. Just a footnote here. If this is starting to sound like the kind of game that you hate, if you would like to see Professor Layton tried for crimes against good times, I think you should trust your instincts. Listen, I really like this game, I'm gonna recommend it later, but there's no getting away from the fact that it is mostly an exceptionally well-dressed Sudoku, and you don't have to let it into your house unless you absolutely want to. But you might want to, because this game has got some moves. So, let's recap. This is a game where players are going to be slashing through symbol after symbol, chopping their way through a thicket of possibilities with a machete made of logic and an arm made of, I mean, the arm can just be your arm still. Is that all this game is? We, I, I mean, sort of, but also no! There's two things I'm gonna teach you that give this game really interesting wrinkles. And first, I'm gonna teach you how you actually take your turn. And second, I'm gonna teach you about how the one of you that finds Planet X, might not win the game. So first, let me walk you through the winsomely inadequate tools you have to solve this puzzle. So, on your turn, you will pick one of several things to do to mug more information out of the app. Mostly on your turn, you're going to be surveying. And this is a process of picking a band of sectors from the half of the board that's visible in any one moment. I was never gonna get through this review without doing that. And then asking the app how many of a given thing is in that band, but not where they are. So you're gonna get better answers by surveying smaller bands, but that takes more time and this is the heart of the game. When you take an action, depending on how greedy that you were in your hunt for information, what color am I? Blue. You will move your telescope forward that many spaces and whoever's turn it is, is whoever's telescope is further back. 
You see, the other options you have on your turn are research, which takes almost no time but gives you an extra logic rule that may or may not help, or twice in the game you can target a sector, which takes a ton of time but the app simply tells you what's in that sector, unless it's Planet X, then the app will tell you that sector is empty because, of course, nothing in this game is easy ever. Now, the reason this is so good in a game which is really just a puzzle is that it means on every single turn you can decide how difficult you want the puzzle to be. If you're storming ahead and you want to shave some seconds off your race, you can ask the app to give you some nightmarishly vague information and you'll take your next turn sooner. But it might not help you and the other players can watch as you strain and sweat and make this game more difficult for yourself. Whereas players who want a more easygoing experience or are having trouble passing the information they already have can just do a target or a really tight band. And not only does this give them solid information and really help them with the puzzle, but it also gives them more time to think before their next turn. This exciting dynamic difficulty setting is on top of the fact that when you start the game, you can choose your own difficulty setting, which gives you more information when the game starts. And on top of that, you can flip the entire board and your personal piece of paper to play with a 12 segment sky instead of the totality of the tamale on the flippity flip with a intimidating 18 segments. And in the difficulty of this game being so dynamic, I'm so much more likely to play it again because I can introduce it to a new group and say, hey, look at this cool thing while playing a difficult game myself while it being easier for them. But equally with that same group, I can play it again and again with the difficulty getting harder and harder and harder every time to keep the game exciting. Now, let's talk about that other wrinkle, which is how you win the game. So as these telescopes continue their fantasia-like march around planet Earth, and this changes the section of the visible sky you can all study, you will also be occasionally triggering research phases. And when that happens, everyone in their closed fists will decide whether to publish zero, one, or two papers saying, I think this item is here. I think this item is here. And this mechanic is how you win the game. It's also how you lose it. There are a ton of points available for whoever finds Planet X, but you'll also get points for publishing research on everything else. All the papers that everyone submits start face down, but over about 10 minutes they will creep down this track and eventually be revealed in a later research phase, at which point the app acting as a stern stand-in for the scientific community, will announce whether that player was right or wrong. Now, if you are right, you and anybody else with the same submission in the queue will get points, but you get more points if you are first. So you want to publish soon, but not too soon, because of course, when your paper is revealed, that's you literally sharing your hard work with the class, and your opponents are imagining in a bung your scientific papers right up into their own filthy calculations. So you want to share your research at the last possible moment while still being first, which is made all the sexier from that open fist calculation. You never know if you should submit now, 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 no, oh no, what have you done? And in a design that is otherwise entirely constructed out of raw logic, this offers a welcome bit of instinctive play around the table. How close do you think your opponents might be to figuring out what's in sector 12? And combine this with the fact that this top right corner of your sheet is for writing down what other players are doing on their turn, because when you take an action in this game, you announce what you're punching into the app, but not what the app replies with. And we've got ourselves a gosh, Done! Board! Game! Just imagine it. You, the yellow player, have been watching the purple player ask the app questions about comets for the whole game, and then the purple player publishes some secret research about what's in Sector 11. Now, you could guess that that is them saying there's a comet there, and you could guess that they're correct, but it's going to be six turns until you know for sure, and you don't have six turns to wait. This is a race. So, are you, yes, yes, you're really gonna do it. You're gonna hinge all of your future working on what you think someone else thinks is in that sector purely because you're afraid that if Blue does that and you don't, then that could be the ball game. Now, this is just such a juicy, wonderful mechanic that involves the players in one another's thinking even if you're not speaking. And best of all, this is my favorite, the penalty for publishing a research theory that turns out to be incorrect is not big, at all. You lose one time unit and you lose that token forever. But what this means is that if you're down to a 50-50 chance of what's in a sector, oh, it's either empty or it's a dwarf planet, 
the game says, hey, maybe you could just publish that because you might be right, which is great, but you have a 100% chance of dicking with your friends. Another thing I really like, the way they've designed the board is such that almost as soon as the game starts, you hit a research phase, which is amazing. You're almost immediately asked, so do you want to publish an academic paper? And I just find that such a funny mental image. You've had your first day at work, you've figured out which end of the telescope is the business end, and you're asked, so you want to publish an academic paper? To which any board gamers worth their salt are going to say, yes. Webster's Dictionary defines asteroids as... Oh, so, in conclusion, I will happily give this game the prestigious Shut Up and Sit Down recommends seal. The Search for Planet X is not for everybody, but it's very clear who it's not for. If you do not enjoy puzzles, guess what? You're not going to enjoy this game because it's literally an hour-long spinning puzzle that's going to feel to you like a cursed merry-go-round. But if you like puzzles, guess what? This is a game that gets absolutely everything right. It is good-looking. It is slim. It is cheap. It is great fun. It is fascinating. And most importantly, there are not many games on the market that it's competing with. In terms of other logical deduction games you could buy, well, you could look at Alchemists, which is a truly excellent game of figuring out how to make potions while trying to stay afloat as a potion business, but it is a real haystack of rules and components that will test all but the very heaviest board gamers. Alternatively, for something more compatible with family members or drunkards, you could look at Treasure Island, which is lovely but funky and fundamentally unfair. Or you could look at Cryptid, which is a solid logical deduction game, but I simply didn't enjoy it half as much as The Search for Planet X, though I'm aware that Cryptid has its fans. In comparison to those games, The Search for Planet X just feels like a pro. It gets in, gets the job done, and gets back out again without even having any setup or teardown. So, how's about that? To round off this review, why don't we have a little look through my telescope? In honor of Planet X, to see what we can see. Oh no! It's true what I said earlier this year! Great card games are everywhere, you just have to look for them! You see, The Search for Planet X is part of a series from Renegade Games celebrating outer space, which I personally think is unnecessary. After all, when was the last time you were thrown a surprise party? By a moon. All the same, Christmas is coming up and I thought to myself, a lot of people out there are fans of space. So I'll just show you Stella as well, in case you wanted something simpler or cheaper than The Search for Planet X or in case you wanted to buy both for the space lover in your life in a kind of cosmic double feature. Stella is a relatively complicated two-player card game. It's also a love letter to the cosmos. You're getting a deck of 60 beautiful celestial objects, each with their own nifty fact, and with them you're going to be playing an strategic card game. Basically, this is a game where you have 11 very thinky turns to amass more points than your opponent, and more importantly, you get to cover this dull boy with cool space stuff. On your turn, you get to pick one of these five cards from the shop to add to your hand, and then you're going to pick one card from your hand to either add somewhere in your telescope or to your notebook. And whichever one you choose, the number on the card you play then decides what card you take from the shop to put in the other. So I play to my notebook, so this goes into my telescope. And if you pick the blank slot from the place where you chose to take the card, then instead you draw blindly from the top of the deck. At the end of the game, you then work out your score by going through each category of celestial body, and you multiply the number of stars of that body in your telescope with the largest contiguous run of numbers in your notebook. 
And it's good. It's a good card game. I really like the fact that uh, it scores using multiplication, which encourages players to chase absolutely ridiculous scores by focusing on one thing, while denying their opponent the chance to do the same. That's nice. It's engaging throughout. It's fun. It's just not one of my favorite two-player card games. This year alone, I recommended Mandala and Air, Land and Sea, both two-player card games that I simply think are more fun than Stella. Also, I'm not in love with the fact that while this game does look great, the black borders on the edge of the cards that they've gone with mean, we all know it, black cards get scuffed really easily. And so just after three or four games, my copy of Stella doesn't look as nice as it did when I bought it, which is a small shame. All the same, it's good. It's good. If you were to tell me you were going to buy Stella for yourself or somebody else, I would say, cool. Uh, so there you have it. Two games from Renegade that do absolutely fantastic PR for the limitless, life-abhorring void over our heads that we like to call outer space. So how's about that for a happy conclusion? But before we wrap up this review, why don't we just have one more look through my old telescope to see if there's just one more game waiting out there for you and me. No, there's not. Thanks for watching, everybody. If you've enjoyed this video, why not check out two contenders for our game of 2020, which would be The King's Dilemma and Pandemic Legacy Season Zero. Hang on. If I'm out there, then how am I in here? Oh no, the paradox. Oh no, the paradox.